We're not there yet. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the live stream. We're here today, um, uh, of course, from the Institute of Metaphysical Science. You can go out to our website at www.scientificmetaphysics.org to see what other programs and materials we have out there. And welcome, uh, and welcome, Betty. Today, we're going to be uh, talking a little bit about I, the book I Say Sunrise by Talbot Mundy. And it's, um, I've got a really old copy of this. <clears throat> Here's what it looks like, I Say Sunrise by Talbot Mundy. And we're going to be starting out with um, a quote from him that is going to start our whole conversation. So, and that is, to enjoy is to charge with joy, as, for example, a battery with electricity, not to absorb joy, but to cause it to be. Yeah. Well, welcome, Betty. Let's start talking about joy, enjoy, action. Let's, yeah. let's look at that. Yeah. I One of the things that, that um, I wanted to say before I... Betty Albee is back. Hold on, let me add her back to the stream. Hello. You'll never make a computer expert out of me, that's for sure. No, it's okay. But so, what I wanted to say was that in in considering the word enjoy the way Talbot Mundy used it in that sentence, I began to play with the letters E-N and thinking about the words that say like enjoy, enhance, endeavor, um, Enervate, and, and I begin to realize that they are really calls for action. Yeah, every one of those words. And I thought, what a great thing to, to, to look at because when you say, I enjoy something, you have called yourself into action on behalf of joy. And I thought, if that's a perfect statement of self responsibility. And I love I the way, love I it. love the way you said it. You said you have called yourself to joy uh you've called yourself to action on behalf of joy. Yeah. The, that's like a really great languaging of exactly what it is cuz you're infusing joy. You're causing it to be. You're not just enjoying the surroundings. You're causing joy. You're bring. You're you're causing joy to be expressed in your world. Yeah. Well, what I what I saw with that, and I hope everybody else can see it too. Hard to find words to put these things into, but the truth of the matter is that I have joy at my fingertips any time at all. If I want to enjoy, it's up to me because the call to action can't be done by somebody else. I can't say, Kim, have me enjoy something. Right. Enjoyment is something up to me. Right. I live right. myself. Right. And how many people have said, I wish I enjoyed X, Y, Z? Yeah. You What's know. that really saying? What they're really saying is I have all these buts. You know how I'm willing to do it, but yeah, I would like to be joyful, but you make that up too. Right. So, but anyway, I, I just was pleased with seeing that the responsibility for enjoy is mine, for enhance is mine, for endeavor is mine, for enervate is mine. So when I say I'm tired, I can do that and buy that picture or I can in enervate. Right. 
and right. revitalize and cause, my and cause that to be not to absorb that not thing, to absorb not to absorb energy, but to cause energy into existence. But it isn't okay. That's a, and then and that's one way that we have described it. But it's but it's more than that. It's like it's like you're calling it into action because it's already present. Yeah. It isn't like you have to cause something. Right. From nothing. Right. It might look that way, but it's already there. You're tapping into it. You're acknowledging right. it being it already present. is being. Yeah. And it's being present in all of its effulgence. And yeah. you are called to action. Yeah. I, I just really was thrilled with seeing that clearly. Yeah. And so the question could be, what do you enjoy? What do you enjoy? And what is the result of your enjoyment? Yeah, and might be a better question to say, is there anything that you can't enjoy? Right. Only if you say so. Yeah. Yeah. You enjoy because you say so, and you don't enjoy it because you say so. Right. In including but, all the other EN words. You know, Margaret used to say joy constitutes man. So it is always present. Yeah. And because you say so, you either have it or you don't. Yeah. In the experience of living, it's always present. Whether right. you in, include it or not is up to you. Right. But it's also a big pointing toward self-responsibility. You know, in, in scientific metaphysics, the, the cornerstone is all is infinite mind, infinitely manifest. And, and we say those words very nicely, but we don't really... Um, own quite often the 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 fact that all that's going on is being being itself calling itself betty or kim or whatever but being being itself totally totally all inclusive all is infinite mind yeah. not just a little bit here and a little bit there and a little bit right. here uh, you know, so it's a self-responsibility situation. And really, all of our living has got to be self-responsible. How can I possibly uh, invent something that doesn't really exist? Right. I can't. Right. So whatever comes up to be um, experienced is rooted in a fact. It's rooted in a truth. It's rooted in a reality. Whether I have knowledge of it or not, it is already present or there would be no possibility of having the experience of it. Right. So it's already established. Yeah. Life is established. Joy is established. Being is established. Perfection is the, the fundamental ground being, ground of being. And, and I just get excited when I realize that we've got all this vocabulary we use that we don't even realize is calling for action as a self-responsible statement of right. being being present. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. I, so like I, I had a lot of fun with that. And it is fun. I love it. And any questions that you want to type in, go ahead and type them in. I've been seeing all the comments when Betty first fell off the call and all that. So I'm seeing all those comments. But Craig Fox says, all is infinite mind and it's in an infinite manifestation for God is all in all. Yeah. And of course, that's Mary Baker Eddy right there, yeah. That's a quote from Mrs. Eddy. And, and uh, she also points out that God is another word for good or vice versa, capital G on both. Mm -hmm. So we, we have from Mary Baker Eddy the seven synonyms that she used because the word God is so misused. You know, it's like there's something separate going on somewhere and we call it God. There isn't anything going on separate from consciousness that you're being right now. There's one thing going on, mm -hmm. all the infinite mind, period, right okay. there. So it's just, it's just fun to see it being said everywhere and shows up everywhere. And that's one of the reasons that Kim and I have been discussing various books 
you know, we talked about a Needleman's book on money and we talked about um, Bruce what was that? book on biology of belief. Yeah, the biology of belief. But, but and now we're talking about <clears throat> Talbot Mundy. And I like the way he talks about things because he gets gets at it differently from a different approach than I've ever seen anyone right. else. And this book was originally published in 1947. So yeah. mine doesn't look like that at all. So when you hold it up, I think, what's that? Yeah. Mine's a black book with a <laughs> right. So, so as we go on here, um, Talbot Mundy also, it goes on that there's another part that says evolution also is an individual experience. Yep. Your own individual, spiritual, consciously recognized and gallantly guarded evolution is the only gift you can give to the world. Yep. And... I have a misspelling there. And your only value of any genuine significance to the world or yourself. Be that as it may. Evolution. Yeah. Yeah. And ahead of that in the book, he says all roads lead to conscious evolution. Yeah. And I love that he used the word conscious because consciousness is fundamental. Right. Without that, there is nothing. You see, yeah. mind action is consciousness. Right. So we've got conscious evolution. We've got enjoy. We've got cause it to be or just acknowledge the joy that's present, bringing in joy or infusing joy or acknowledging joy in your in your world that you're walking through. Yeah. And I like the call to action better than I like the word cause because you don't really cause it. You call it to action. It's already present. Yes. It's already present. There isn't any creation there. Yeah. Yeah. Really. Yeah, very good. So we were also going to talk a bit about peace. Well, you had said something about that earlier, and I thought, well, that would be fun to bring up. So let's explore whatever that idea was, because I don't remember what it was. But Well, you know, I was talking at that point about you can't demonstrate something that doesn't exist. So demonstrating peace in your life, for instance, indicates that you, you have to know that it already exists. How, how would you recognize it if it showed up? Right. So peace is already existent, just like joy is, just like affluence is, abundance. Right. Right. So, and so when it already exists, the thing that has you experience it is acknowledgement. Just think about that. Um, I said to uh, Mrs. Laird one time, um, she said, well, joy constitutes man, so you're happy whether you know it or not. And I said, well, if I don't know about it, what good does it do me? She says, well, what good does it do you when you know about it? Right. And I said, well, when I know about it, I feel happy. She said, well, your feelings are up to you. What's present is present. Yeah. And there we go again with self-responsibility. Yeah. And here's another, here's another statement that I think fits right in here. There's a chapter in this book, chapter nine, called Enjoyment Creates Its Own Evidence. Yeah. And then he goes, he talks about this. I'm just going to share this because it's so cool. Whatever it is that happens to us there. So we can't. We can't remain in this space of acknowledgement for, you know, acknowledgement and uh, and the sense that of the divi divinity of who we are in for very long periods of time, it seems. It's like, boom, it's right here and, you know, like that. And so what he's saying is he's just acknowledging that whatever it is that happens to us, they're a wordless experience, that intuitive knowing the divinity of yourself. Um, drives us forth again to reconciliate or to recondition our existence, whether we do so do so choose or not, our personality reclaims us. Yeah. Here we are, here we are back <clears throat> again in the illusion part of it, existing in association with a personality and remarkably conscious of it, even though it is an illusion. 
It is a describable, definable ag aggregation of logical facts. Wisdom, on the other hand, is indescribable. But the will of wisdom acts as an absolute and irresistible force. We have brought with us back into the illusion what the East calls fohat, that is to say spiritual energy, that is an, as inscribable as, and as undefinable in words as wisdom itself. So it's, it's interesting, this whole conversation, because it is all self-responsibility. You are all in the world, you, you know, you are all. You walk through. Right. All of it. Yeah. Yeah. So it says, and it says here, it says, we individuals, we still are in our secret place. We have become conscious of that. And that secret place would be that intuitive knowing that sense that there's more to, to us than meets the eye. Mm -hmm. um, and he says, all hell can never destroy our consciousness of individual being, nor completely restore the illusion to what it seemed to be before we appealed to wisdom. Yeah. I mean, it reminds me of the matrix, red pill or blue pill. Do you know what I mean? And you can't not take, you can't take back the red pill. Do you know what I mean? Explain it. Huh? Explain it. Go watch the matrix. <laughs> it's excellent. But it's yeah. like, you know, red pill or blue pill. And I think it was like, well, I'll have the red pill. And it's, and it's like, that shows you how deep the rabbit hole really goes. And it really does show you the, oneness of being yeah. that you are all of it and it's you can never go back once you see it right. and that's the whole thing he's saying here about calling it wisdom yeah mary baker eddie said there's no retrograde retrograde step right so you can never go backwards right so there's a question how does monetary abundance show up in our daily living monetary abundance exists doesn't it how do you know it exists? Because there it is. Where is it? In my world, it shows up as my ability to purchase certain things. It looks like a method of exchange, monetary abundance. Yeah. That's what I would say. It looks like my ability to purchase or to exchange things for other things. Yeah. In varying degrees of. Yeah. Well, abundance would mean, you know, I've got what I need and a little bit more perhaps or a lot more than you need. Yeah. Everything right. Without, without lack. Right. So it exists. Now, how do you have it be part of your experience in your human living? Mm -hmm. That's the question, isn't it? Right. I think so. And that somebody would have to, whoever asked that question would have to chime in and say, so how does monetary monetary abundance show up? in our daily living. Yeah, well, how did how does joy show up? Right. It's a call to action. Right, I wanna say in money, <laughs> in abundance. No, but all of our living is a call to action. Yeah, yeah, it's all action, it's all, but here's the thing is, acknowledgement itself, is that the call, is that the, the infusing with action or infusing with that or acknowledging causing it to be. You see well, what I'm saying? Let's just say it this way. Acknowledgement is the open window. Yeah. For having it show up. Yeah. Yeah. If I come from acknowledging lack and wondering why abundance doesn't show up, it's because I've got a window open that's on lack. Yeah. And so I experience it that way. If I'm going to experience joy when there's no joy present in my moment, I have to look at all of the things that I know about joy and begin to move into that presence. And pretty soon, I, you know, very quickly, actually, snap of a finger. Joy is present. Mm -hmm. Same thing is true with anything at all. If I'm looking at at lack, I don't have to look very long before I'm groaning and saying, "Oh dear, oh dear, what am I going to do? How am I going to manage? 
you know, what will pay the bills and so on. So if I'm going to have abundance, I have to live in the presence of abundance. I have to live in the flavor of abundance. I have to live in the, really the, the acknowledgement that abundance is present or I wouldn't know anything about it. Right. The fact that I know about it, it's already present. And there's no such thing as your abundance, but my lack, there's just abundance. And then there's the experience of no abundance. And then there's abundance. And then there's the experience of abundance. Right. And there's the experience of, oh dear, where'd it go? Now right. it's black again. It's called human living, everyday right. stuff. And Diane says, for me, it shows up when it's needed, whether for rent or whatever. Coarse mind love supplies the human need. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah, and it, and you know it occurred it occurred for me that just the act of acknowledgement is the willingness to have it show up. Well, it opens the window. You yeah. know, you can acknowledge saying, "I know, I know that there's nothing missing. That perfection is present, abundance is present. If it weren't, I wouldn't even know about it. So it is present." But and that's where the willingness comes in. I've opened the window, but when I say, but I'm about to give you all the reasons why I don't see it. Mm -hmm. So I'm opening a window and I'm filling it with black. Right. So I don't want to do that. Right. So when I open the window, I want to say, all right, this window says that what is so is that abundance is ever present. And it's all that's present. It fills all space. It's, it's native to being. So then I could say this is the hat God's wearing today, no it matter is. if it's if it fits my pictures of abundance or not. And I and I now use that if I'm going to use the, the word G-O-D, I call it the God idea. So it's mind or it's love or it's life or it's uh, consciousness. But it's fundamental. And it's grounded in perfection, and it's omnipotent, and it's omniscient, and it's omnipresent. Mm -hmm. And when I'm in that space, there isn't any way that my human experience isn't going to be free and whole and, and comfortable. Yeah. Are you ready for a quiz? Sure. Okay. So here's the, here's the question. Mrs. Laird made the statement. I may see you and you may see me, but what we see is, and they can't remember what we be, but what we see is what we be. Mm -hmm. So here's how the whole thing goes. Whoever asked this question, Mrs. Laird made the statement. I may, I may see you and you may see me, but what we see is what we be. Yes. And that's a poem. And you will be interested to know who wrote the poem. Who wrote it? Your father. My dad wrote it? Edward yeah. Albee? Yeah. And it's in one of her seminars. And I can't tell you which one right now. But he reads the whole poem. It's quite a bit longer than that. But yeah. those lines are part of that poem. I would love to know what seminar that is. If anybody has that, I would love to know what that is. I'm now going to have to go figure it out. That's okay. awesome. Yeah. He, and it was kind of cute because, you know, Brad Kling in, in the IMS is a poet. And he's many other things, but he is a good poet. And he's been writing poems that have appeared in Margaret's writing and in the Laird letters and also in our newsletters. And we've loved them. And when Ed got up to give his poem, he said, I thought I'd give my Brad self a little competition. Ha! Ah, that's great. Yeah. Oh, that's fun. I love that. Yeah. All right. So, um, so then when we look at peace, is there anywhere that peace is not? Or does the acknowledgement or the yearning for peace, just acknowledging that peace is all there is, or peace is present? Well, there's only even one. In the look, even in the look of, of war and famine, whatever, you know what I'm saying? Well, you know, if you can look at it, semantically, if I can put it that way. Um, peace is the presence seen 
as war. If I'm looking at it from a limited point of view, as if it were something going on external to my being, mm -hmm. as if it were some separate power right there somewhere that I have no control over. That'll look like war or chaos or lack or any of the other things. Right. But if, you, if you've established the fact of being accurately, the other is a point of view on that. Mm -hmm. Point of view on peace. How do I define peace in human living? I don't actually know what peace is. But in human living, oh, it means no war. Yeah. And, and that's a pretty limited view of peace. But that's the way we define things. How do I know what's good? Oh, I've got a picture of what's bad. If it right. isn't bad, it's got to be good. Right. And that's all in the paradox. You've got that's as much good as you've got bad. In that world, you've got as much good as you've got bad. It's You're defining one is defined by the other. So they both must exist for their own definition. No, one thing exists. Seen, no, but the look. Seen variously. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. One thing, you know, the paradox line that calls good and bad. Yeah. That's all one whole scene yeah. in the language. And you live it as you choose. Yeah. You know, when I think I have abundance, I haven't got a clue what abundance is. Right. I just think it means I can pay for all my bills and, and a little bit more. Right. You know, or a whole lot more, maybe. Well, let's not get too greedy now. Yeah, well, you know, there we are. But the fact of the matter is nothing is ever missing. Right. In reality, it's whole, it's perfect, it's complete, it's joyous, it's free. Right. It's satisfying, it's fulfilling, all of those things. And that's true of every aspect of being. Yeah. So if, if I'm going to look at it on the level of what I observe, the language world that I'm walking through, I'm going to see it according to the way I'm able to see it. Right. Not the way it is. You know, we live the world as we are, not as it is. Right. So I'm going to always see the paradox balance of everything that I experience humanly. Mm hmm and when I have no right or wrong in the picture, just let it be. Right. Except for in a lot of our living, we don't have it that there's no right or wrong in the picture. I mean, let's just, I mean, that's part of the, the crux of where problems for us start and exacerbate is because we have a picture of the way we want it to be. It's not that way. So then we bring, you know, you bring science into the picture and you say, okay, well, all is infinite mind. And you can go, okay, all is infinite minds, perfection, function, all that. And then you look out in your world and go, oh, it hasn't changed. All is perfection, function, all. And that would be like, that would be like using science as a pill. Might as well just take a Tylenol for your headache, yeah? Because what you're doing is you're not okay with the picture. You're not letting it be. You're resisting that. So anytime you have any kind of judgment or opinion or evaluation on what the world looks like, I will, now, I will now quote, I may see you and you may see me, but what we see is what we be. Right. And that gets at being. Mm -hmm. And who, and it's not, if you're looking at, you know, the world and you're seeing lack or you're seeing a problem or whatever, I think you got, it all comes back to, well, who am I being? Yeah. Who am I being? Am I being a two-legged human being, animal, whatever, with a problem? Or am I the divinity and the consciousness that sources everything? Yeah, and, and you're talking about your human um, tendency to, to run things. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that's what science came along to tell us. Yeah. You know, it, it looks like all this stuff. And it's the first time we ever got, it's the first time for me anyway, that I ever got a clear picture of what the language world is all about. It simply is my point of view, the best one I've got day by day of what's right. actually present. What's actually present is God being. Right. And it's all that's present. Nothing yeah. else is. We've got another question. Question. 
question from Jennifer. I just heard Brene Brown say that the opposite of scarcity isn't abundance, but the opposite is enough. And she says, not sure I get that. Does that make sense to you? Sure. Say more. Well, scarcity means my I have an experience of not enough. So the opposite of it is I have enough. Right. Right. She's not talking about lack, she's talking about scarcity. Right. Not enough. Right. Does that make sense? That's cool. Yeah. Totally awesome. Mm -hmm. So so this whole how do you want to wrap up? Because we're now we've now we're coming to the end of our little time and oh how do we want to wrap it up. I, I just wanted to encourage people, let us know if you've run into a book that's got a lot of really juicy stuff that fits right in with what we're talking about here, because we're always interested and we're going to look pretty soon. I don't know which, which weekend, but anyway, one week we're going to talk about uh, Alan Watts book. Uh, the Wisdom of Insecurity. Yeah. And, and there are several books like that. So if you have some books in your experience that have been helpful and that you've enjoyed, share them with us so we can continue this because I'm telling you, this science is not brand new. It's not the current rage. It has been going on forever. And you find it in old writings and you find it in current literature. I pick it up all the time in just plain old novels. You know, I can be reading a, a, a love story, for instance, and I'll find two or three lines that are pure science in there. And I just love it. I pick them out when I can. I'll share some of those with you one day. I've got a, a file that I keep some of these in. <laughs> Very cool. But it's right. wonderful to see it all around. That's right. So we will be here again next Wednesday um, at 7 o'clock Central Time, 5 o'clock Pacific, um, both on YouTube and Facebook. So uh, again, who we are is the Institute of Metaphysical Science. And you can go and check out any of our programs, our writings, uh, books and pamphlets that are available, um, any seminars that we have. We have MP3s uh, of them and some of them we have still have CDs, uh, but there's a whole variety of things. We have an uh, introduction to scientific metaphysics, um, self-study course that's available that comes in DVDs and a workbook uh, and it's excellent. So any of that stuff that would support your exploration, support your practice of science, you can find that at scientificmetaphysics.org. We're a nonprofit organization. We'd love any support uh, and stuff like that should you find this valuable and help us continue that work. Um, so let's see. So we have thank you and uh, oldie, uh, okay, but good, oldie but goody. Much Love Pop is what uh, Sarah Busey said for a book. Mm -hmm. And um, Lita says, Lita says um, um, thank you. And Craig Fox says, from a devout Christian scientist, thank you. Lovely. So thank you so much, Craig. Um, any rate, so we will see you again next time, uh, next Wednesday, 7 o'clock Central, 5 o'clock Pacific. Until then. Bye-bye.